Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine, how you want? <laughs> you have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what? What? What seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? He ate two feet before we nursed. Oh, listen, Laverne, you shit face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. <laughs> top men. Welcome to the second hour, everybody. Here we go. You have found the fun and frivolity of the Barbecue Central show. It's a show that happens every week, live on Tuesdays from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you're getting this for the first time on a podcast, make time on a Tuesday to tune in live and see how it goes down. I mean, certainly your recording is giving you that sneak peek, if you will. But it's not as fun as being around the gang and seeing what could happen because it's a live show. Somebody doesn't answer. I have a technical issue. Who knows? It's always fun to be involved in that when it's happening. Certainly it's new to you on the pot, but you know what I'm saying. Come on. Check me out live. Check me out live. 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on podcast, hour number one goes out Wednesday. Hour number two goes out Thursday. And the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less comes out every Friday. So three days of podcast content, as it has been for the majority of 2018, if not all of 2018. Uh, Don't forget, you can follow me socially on Instagram and Twitter at BBQ Central Show. And also friend me up on the Facebooks or give me a like or whatever you do on Facebook. Slash BBQ Central Show is where you can find me there. Still to come on the show this evening, David Qualls from the American Dream Barbecue team is running for the Kansas City Barbecue Society Board of Director and or the seats that are currently open for vote. So we'll be getting to him in about 12 minutes from now. And then helping me close the show is Brian Crawford from Crawford's Barbecue. And we'll be talking about his product called Pit Spritz, hoping to make your barbecue ribs and or pork a little bit better than it is right now. And it doesn't have to necessarily be for competition. You can use it in the backyard, as I'm sure Brian will get into. He is a competition cook, so there is probably some type of an efficiency component on how the whole rib or the uh, Pit Spritz was born. But once again, we'll uh, talk with Brian in a couple minutes about that. Actually, more like 30 minutes from now. Hey, uh, don't forget, as I mentioned each and every week, I missed last week, but this week I will be back making my regular real radio appearance as guest on the John Cupo show. Locally here in Cleveland, you can find him within a three, four county radius, um, Lake Ashtabula, Cuyahoga, and so forth, 101.5 FM dial and 1330 AM dial, or if you are not near any of those and you still want to hear me be more of a contributor slash guest versus host, WINTradio.com. That's W-I-N as in November, T radio.com. That will get you to the live audio feed on the internet. I usually come in around 730 and it runs about 60 minutes or so, usually out of there around 830 because they have a movie critic that comes in and closes out the show with them. So if you're wondering what it sounds like when I'm being asked questions and how I answer barbecue and grilling related topics, tune in each and every Friday to the John Cupo Show. Again, that's 101.5 FM and 1330 AM. Local here to Cleveland, and when I mean local, you know, pretty local to Willoughby or 20 miles out. Or forego all that nonsense, wintradio.com. Got an email from Jeffrey Stone. It says, good evening, Greg. Being an avid centralite, I have had the pleasure of listening to your show for several years. And I have to say that here as of late, your show has been particularly stellar. Most notably, I am referring to the shows with the foraging guy, Jeremy Yamansky. 
and owner of Larder Delicatessen, by the way. I'm adding that ad lib in myself. Pat LaFrieda's most recent interview, Sam the Cooking Guy, and the regulars to include Meathead and Stephen Reichlin in their Thanksgiving takes. Not that the other segments haven't been great, but these particularly seem to stand out for me. Additionally, the Michael Simon extra interview rocked it. He didn't come off as a celebrity, but instead seemed like the type of guy with whom you could sit down and have a beer with. I could have listened to Pat LaFrieda and Jeremy Yamansky talk for hours as they were totally engaging and interesting as all get out. Your A game has been elevated to A plus in my book for whatever that might be worth to you. Merry Christmas to you and your family. I look forward to another year of entertaining and informative shows with regards Jeffrey Stone, Grandpa's Pride Barbecue. Jeffrey, thank you. Uh, to be known, Jeffrey is a long time centralite when he says that he's been listening to the show for several years. Certainly that is verifiable. He does send me email communications from time to time. I think I've read his stuff on the air in the past as well, but certainly appreciate your weighing in. The one thing that I have to totally agree with you on, Jeffrey, is how great Jeremy Yamansky from Larder was and how much knowledge. Look, let's be honest. What might have been your first reaction when I said, hey, I have a foraging expert coming on the show. We're going to be talking about mushrooms and all of this other stuff. You, you probably were a little hesitant on if you were going to be listening for the long haul during that segment. Because, you know, maybe foraging seems a little nerdy or something that you might not be into or it's not live fire or whatever. And while the show continues by and large to be a barbecue and grilling show, it's not always about barbecue and grilling. Henceforth, me bringing Jeremy Yamansky in and talking about his expertise and breadth of knowledge in the mushroom foraging industry. Widely considered to be an expert in the land, not not the land like we say Cleveland. That's I don't know if you're familiar with that, but recently Cleveland started being called the land. I'm saying like the United States. From a countrywide perspective, Jeremy is widely considered to be a top authority on mushrooms. And the greater Cleveland area has, I think he said, 132 different species of mushrooms growing all right here, second only to the Pacific Northwest. And certainly they have a climate that's ripe to grow probably seven times more different mushrooms than we would get here in the Cleveland area or at least surrounding areas. So he was absolutely spectacular, and I am already remiss that I have not rebooked him for a second foray into the Barbecue Central Show Jungle, but I will be doing that because I hope to be getting a nice lunch over at Larder at some point this week, if not tomorrow, and that's sketchy. Definitely Thursday looking pretty good. Friday certainly looks pretty good. If not either of those, Sunday could be looking really good because we'll be taking in a Cavaliers game. So Jeremy Umansky was great. Pat LaFrieda hit mixed reviews up front, and we had an issue in the second interview with him because we couldn't connect. But the third installment of Pat LaFrieda was absolutely spectacular. In fact, I got a Twitter from... Uh, at Sirius J that said that in his opinion, and he had actually done an interview with Pat LaFrieda himself at some point, and I would love to hear that, but as someone who had interviewed Pat LaFrieda himself and then heard my other Pat LaFrieda interviews, he said the third one was absolutely the definitive Pat LaFrieda interview. So that was some pretty high praise from a guy that's got a pretty big following out there in the Twitter sphere. And, of course, the regulars are doing what regulars do. Stephen Reichlin doing great. Meathead, obviously, he was just on, did great prime rib talk. And we talked about food safety with food savers. And 
botulism. I didn't know botulism could just fall out of the sky. I like to live in a naive world with my head in the proverbial sand. If my head is in the sand, maybe it'll stay away from the botulism that is dropping out of the sky. Did anybody else know that botulism drops out of the sky like that? Like, I don't know if it just necessarily synthesizes out of thin air, but bacteria is all around us, as <laughs> Meathead said. That's a little unnerving to me. I'm not a germaphobe by any stretch of the imagination, but I thought botulism had to exist on something in order for you to, like, cross-contaminate, and now you have botulism kind of a thing. But, you know, fun stuff for you to learn here on the show. As I said, it's not always a live fire barbecue grilling show, but most of the time it is. And now you know botulism could just drop on your food and you could be screwed at any given point. Thanks again to Jeffrey Stone for weighing in on his like of the show recently. Thank you, Jeffrey. Let me talk to you quickly about Green Mountain Grills before we get to Dave Qualls from the American Dream Barbecue team and why he's running for KCBS. Uh, Green Mountain Grills, they offer some of the best pellet cookers out there on the market today. Three different sizes to choose from. If you are into football right now and you're really big into the tailgating, of course, you want to look at the Davy Crockett. This one is extremely portable, fits in your trucks, vans, and SUVs. If you don't have access to a traditional power outlet, no worries. Just plug it into the 12-volt adapter that you have in your specific vehicle. You get that great wood-fired flavor. Why? Because the Davy Crockett runs on pellets. All Green Mountain Grills are pellet-driven cookers. And you're not sacrificing a tremendous amount of capacity for its portability and convenience. Now, if you want something a little bit more patio-friendly and decorative, you want to look at the Daniel Boone and the Jim Bowie options. Daniel Boone is mid-size. Jim Bowie is your big monster. Both of these can accommodate that high heat pizza oven insert that I like to talk about each and every week. So if you're going to get one, you know, if you're on the fence on buying the bigger one, saving a couple hundred bucks on the medium sized one, don't ever live like that. You're setting yourself up for a lifetime of regret. And for just a couple hundred bucks, you can increase your cooking capacity dramatically. And again, it will accept the pizza oven insert as well. Now, I have both. The Daniel Boone for me is more pizza oven relegated. But if I need to rip that pizza oven insert out, I do it. And now I have two great size pellet cookers to do wings on one and ribs on another. Whatever I have going that thing. They also offer sauces and rubs and pellets, obviously, to fire those cookers. So check them out online, greenmountaingrills.com. That's greenmountaingrills.com. And check out what they have. If you have any questions, shoot them a call. Shoot them an email. Their support is great. And we're looking to line up Jason Baker, owner of Green Mountain Grills, here sooner than later for some big announcements. We're back with David Qualls from the American Dream Barbecue team right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Show, giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead, the author of a barbecue bible, bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show is being brought to you by Smithfield. If you haven't checked out smokingwithsmithfield.com, you're doing yourself a disservice. Go ahead. Head on over there. See if they still have openings for that committed cooks program. 500 spots. I believe there was a small handful left uh, last I checked. So head on over to smokingwithsmithfield.com. Also, January 8th, we will reveal the Smithfield Grant winners. Not sure exactly who we'll have from Smithfield on that, but if you're interested in seeing if your event is being considered or was considered and now we'll have access to the Smithfield Grant, tune in January 8th and you will figure it out. Again, that website is smithfield.com. 
or smokingwithsmithfield.com. Right, my first guest in the second hour, longtime friend of the show, as a promoter, he has put on his own successful KCBS sanctioned barbecue competition. As a cook, he has cooked and won some of the biggest events that cooks like to take down before they call it a career. And tonight he is telling us why he's deciding to make a run for the KCBS board of directors. So let's go ahead and race to the Traeger Grills hotline. And welcome back, friend of the show, David Qualls. Hold on, David. I hit the wrong button. David, how are you, buddy? Hey, Greg. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, David. Appreciate you making time, as always, here for the show. Now, Well, thanks for having me. You know, a huge part of me <clears throat> wants to talk you out of doing this, Dave. And certainly, <laughs> there's no guarantee that running obviously gets you elected, and I know you get that. But as you look through the history of this show, folks who show up running or hoping to run for the KCBS board kind of get voted in to the KCBS board. And you hear from the current members, or at least some of them, that being on the board is a thankless job and you're constantly taking yes. flack and all of this other stuff. So are, are you really ready to put yourself in front of all that? Well, I'm no stranger to uh, being a public officer. And so, you know, you've got to be thick skinned. You've got to take business as business and personal as personal. And so, you know, I, I'm ready for it. Yes. How many seats are up? Five. So that's a pretty decent number, right? Five seats. And I think nine, 10 or 11 candidates running at this point. Yes. Do you know how many are up for a reelection? Just one, I believe. Two termed out, and then I believe uh, there were two uh, resignations to fill unexpired terms. And so only one member that is eligible as an incumbent, I believe, that's only one. All right, so just from I think from that's a, Arlie Bragg's seat. Arlie Bragg, okay. Make yeah. a note of that. Um, okay, so just from a, a high level first, and then we'll dig into some of the points, because I know you sent me some graphs and stuff that we can show mm -hmm. as well. What do you feel uniquely qualifies you to ask for somebody's vote for this Kansas City Barbecue Society's board? Well, I've cooked pretty active since 2012, over 200 contests, 30 grands. I've put on contests. Um, I'm a uh, longtime chairman of a very large trade association, so I understand what it takes to, uh, to represent. I understand uh, the issues behind being a nonprofit organization and what you have to do as your mission to your members. Um, I want to do this to promote the sport of barbecue. Uh, I feel like that there are needs of the membership that needs to be addressed. We need to promote and, and do something to in, enhance and fix the communication transparency problems right now that has existed in the last couple of years between leadership and membership. And then uh, first and you know final and most importantly is uh, we've got to do something to stabilize the physical responsibility of the future of this organization. Uh, barbecues getting expensive. Uh, a lot of money's being put into organization to, to KCBS, you know, through what I read in their tax returns to promote barbecue. But I don't see that coming back to teams. I don't see it coming to contest organizers. I, you know, I don't know where it is again. You know, so I'm you just going to try and make barbecue <laughs> great again. Look at that. love the hat, Dave. Um, Thanks. You know, I, I do hear. <laughs> Certain things brought up each and every year. Maybe, maybe this is the first time I've actually heard about, you know, fiscal or uh, fiscal viability and you know uh, financials and stuff like this. But some of the other stuff we've kind of heard. I mean, are they legitimate concerns or are they things that people are just continuing to regurgitate because they heard it the last time and somebody's saying, "Well, this didn't get addressed again." Well, you know, you you see things through minutes of the meetings and you see things at contests and stuff that that makes you wonder what's going on and you see large sponsorships but then you see contests going away but you know, if you dig down into it, it a little deeper, because KCBS is a uh, nonprofit organization, their tax returns have to be published. And uh, based on those published tax returns, their last five years, they brought in $8 million in gross receipts and uh, basically have only kept about 4% of that money. 
And and then the last two years, for the first time that in that I can find in published returns, they've actually lost money on large on their largest sums of income coming in. Uh, the last revenue figures of, of 2017, $1.7 million in gross receipts and posted a $133,000 loss. You know, if this was uh, that Tom Hanks movie, I'd be saying, show me the money. I mean, wh- wh- what did we do with it? Because we've seen contest dwindle. We've seen membership decline, but we've seen this large surge of revenue coming in, yet we're posting a loss. And... Uh, but on the tax returns, and when it shows benefits paid to members, that's always zero. You know, so what are we doing to uh, to to promote barbecue, which is the mission statement of bar- of KCBS? And you know, and I'm not t- attacking KCBS. I'm attacking the system. What's what's the engine in this train that's causing this problem? Because we as cooks. We see that, you know, we see contests dying that we're having a great time cooking at. We see membership dwindling. We see these issues of failed websites and and, and poor communication and, and supposedly a lack of staff. But, but when you look at a large amount of money, a $1.7 million just in one year coming in lost money, where did that money go? What, what what was it used for? Because it obviously wasn't used to be promote barbecue at the level that we could see as cooks and teams and judges and organizers and literally spectators of the sport. So I don't want to put you in a speculatory position here, but I agree. I mean, $1.75 million. I mean, if, if the show brought $1.75 million in one year, I mean, that would be great. Uh, but sure. and then somehow I was able to finagle a hundred and thirty three thousand dollar loss. I mean, I would imagine a lot of people would want to figure out where not only one point seven five million of that went, but an additional one hundred and thirty three in the hole. So, do well, you, I mean, are, are there salaries that board members get, or salaries that people that work in the KCBS corporate office get, or are they really spending a lot of money on advertising or something like this? Well, I don't know. The tax return publishes, you know, the salaries and the salaries for the board do do not seem out of line. It's not like anybody's making a quarter million dollars a year answering the phone at KCBS. But what bothers me is you can look into um, like 2017 for chance other expenses, which is not expenses specifically identified in their tax returns, $1.4 million. Almost 70% of the money that came in went back out with no explanation on the tax return. But KCBS won't publish a financial statement. Their financial reports in the minutes of their meeting are not published other than just posted a financial report given. And so, you know, it leads us to what are they spending the money on? You know, we know they bought a big new building. We know that now they're going to sell that building. And and to me, they, it's like they've used our money for a failed real estate venture transaction. You know, uh, there's nothing against a nonprofit owning a piece of real estate. Sure. But if they wagered everything that they had plus their cash and threw the baby out with the bathwater, that doesn't make sense. You know, it really bothers me that we're losing contests, we're losing membership, yet every month when I when I read the minutes of these committees, the membership committee's talking about, well, we're going to do a phone blast or we're going to do an email blast. No one addresses the fact that membership's falling. Now, we're all, we're all about publishing how many Twitter responses we had. <laughs> And and but that doesn't do anything. Yet at the same time, we're losing memberships. We're exponentially creating more judges. We're using judges as a revenue tool. And we it, it's been no no mystery. When I ran for the board four years ago and was probably too new to be known, one of the biggest problems then was judging. Then when this technology came out to show what table you landed on and judge averages. You know, the, 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 the train left the station with there's a problem in judging. Tables of death, tables of angels, and I know they've done a lot of work from outside help. A volunteer, Mark Gibbs, put together a program to try and seat judges and balance them. Not any technology spent with this millions of dollars of income, but just a layman member trying to make barbecue better that has tried to help the system. But until they actually spend some real money and quit just churning judges for profit, that part of the program's not going to help. And 
anybody that drops fifteen hundred dollars to cook a contest thinks they did a halfway good job just to get hammered on something, and knowing in the back of their mind there's a problem with judging. When reps walk up to you and say, "Hey, I'm sorry, but you hit that table of death today," I mean, what what else do you have to do but but be an armchair quarterback because the the our leadership is not talking to us one on one. Our leadership talks at us, but they don't talk to us. David Qualls joining me here on the show. His website, by the way, uh, that shows his running platforms, davidqualls.com, uh, Q-U-A-L-L-S, davidqualls.com. All right, so let's go ahead and hit on some of those uh, platforms. We have like uh, three or so that you had sent me graphs on, so I can flash those up if you want to maybe start with sure. team participation because you've mentioned that a couple times. Okay. Uh, our team participation has, uh, has, has went down uh, every year here lately. Um, you can see in 2013 was pretty much the peak that we had uh, 40, 40 teams average per contest, and it has just fell down to as low as um, 35 teams. Um, if you lose the gra- graph that shows the red, that one right there, yep. you'll see in 2018, take away the Royal and the Sams, the average number of teams per contest across the nation was 35 teams, and that's with the number of contests that's fell off. Yet the board wants to raise the number of teams for team of the year to qualify and publish in their minutes to benefit bigger contests. Well, it's the backbone. It's this small 35-team Lions Club, Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Red Cross-type group that's the backbone of this deal. And even by changing the team of the year issue, which has got its own problems and needs an overhaul itself, This does nothing to help it. The board just makes knee-jerk decisions, and it took a hell of a grassroots campaign again this year to get them to lay that on the table again at the 11th hour. All right, next up is uh, contests per year. Contests are falling off. Uh, And and they can, you know, from a peak in 2015 of 483 contests, we're down to 422. And... uh, you know, they'll say, well, we didn't have Sam's this year, but then you picked up other contests. The bottom line is, is Sam's took the place of a lot of contests when they came in, but contests are down. Team participation is down. It's running hand in hand. If, if it was just a contest problem, team participation would have been up in the average number of teams per contest, but they're both falling off and surprise memberships falling off at the same time but there's a strange integer in that in that that series too and it has to do with the number of judges do you buy in at all to the international help of contests that they kind of bolster the overall number or does should that not be necessarily considered well, I don't think it's necessarily considered in a fact because contests has went down with the addition of all these increased international contests. And I, and first and foremost, don't get me wrong, I think the whole international program is great. Sure, the barbecue is going worldwide, and 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 I believe that what they're doing is great. It's probably the best thing in barbecue right now of what they're exposing to people over there with barbecue because it's, it's really cool. And, and I like that, but go back to what we're talking about is if team participation's down, contests are down, but new contests are coming on, but the memberships fell off to eight less than, I think under, under 18,000 now or right at 18,000 under 19,000. But they've added in the last, we lost 53 contests in 27, 2018, but we've picked up 2,423 new judges. So where does that make sense? We're losing contests, creating judges. We have a known judge problem. And in that same 18 months, we've lost 1,900 members after picking up 2,300 judges. So, you know, look at that swing. Add those num- numbers together. There's 4,000 person swing there. And, uh, and that's just in dues paid membership at $40 a head. So uh, we keep saturating the market with judges. And then we wonder why we're hitting bad tables, even though we're averaging the best we can. We've got guys that are cooking three contests, then that's all they can get into a year. But then we have guys that are locking in and cooking 30 contests a year. We have got to stop creating judges as a revenue tool. If you get in, is there 
one of these things that you would like to tackle first? I mean, I think you know a lot of people that are running for a board have a, a good platform or a number of ideas, but in reality, what can you really get pressed across during your time in? So, like, what ranks highest on your priority? Is it figuring out what the financial situation is first and foremost, and then moving into a team or a contest fall-off thing? Well, if you're reading the bull sheet, they ask a short-term and long-term goals issues, and there are, I named two or three things there that are short-term goals and are all equally as important. And, yes, yes, the, the, the falling membership – the uh, the issue of, uh, of of contests, the judging issue, uh, and and the revenue and the financial background is is they're all equally important and they're immediate and it's not going to be one guy can handle that. But the most important thing to me, first and foremost, is is improve this communication. Let's eliminate this transparency. So there's no doubt. Let's not be ashamed to say, hey. We've messed up and we've spent, you know, the money, you know, that we should have went to barbecue and we've lost sponsors or we're doing business with ourselves or something. But let's let's open the books. Let's let's open the shades and, and create some sunlight into this organization. Let's drop the transparency and communication. Once you start doing that and the right hand begins working with the left hand in this issue, then you'll see contest stabilize. You'll see membership confidence levels rise, which will mean memberships will come back. And then if we work on something strong, don't meet by a committee. And I, I'm not saying anything against the CBJ committee or the rep committees. Those are hardworking guys. But you've got to be able to give them the attention and the tools to work faster than to meet one night a month, nine months out of the year, change one rule, and then make it happen. We've got to work faster. And that's going to come from the day-to-day -day administrative staff. And, and we've got to deal with an administrative staff that can act. We have a board that micromanages an 18,000 million or an 18,000 member organization, which the day-to-day -day staff should handle that. You know, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm chairman of the Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association, which is the largest trade association for gaming in Oklahoma with 38 tribes. I have 38 members on the board of directors. I have 300,000 members in that organization. And it's a five billion dollar industry. Do you think thirty eight of us could guide an industry like that? No. We have a staff with a strong director and leadership and, and attorneys and accountants that say, okay, here's where we're going. Here's our recommendation based on our professional expertise and 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 this is where we need to go. And then we give them the tools and the budget to make it happen. You know, and and in the last 30 years in gaming, I've been chairman of that organization almost two decades. Huh. So uh, I believe I know how to at least unify a board of 12 and assemble a group of people that can get something done with a million dollar a year budget. David Qualls joining me here on the show, and he's graciously asking for your consideration to vote for him for the 2019 opening KCBS Board of Directors. Uh, when does voting start and end, Dave? Well, I think voting starts January 2nd, and then it ends, I believe, the 15th or the 16th, something like that. I don't have that date in front of me. They're just in the minutes of the meeting. They're going to roll out at the 11th hour the new website and handle the voting themselves now instead of a uh, independent body oh. uh, handling the voting process. And I honestly, I have a problem with that. I wrote a long, uh, detailed email to the board today about this, of that you have to now get signed up to the KCBS website before you can even figure out how to get into it to vote. And this system was supposed to be live in September. It's still not live today. And we start voting in a week or two weeks from now, three weeks from now, whatever it is. And uh, given KCBS's reputation of handling technology rollouts, be it uh, the judge program, the uh, SAM sign up, uh, just a simple website, the simple mobile app for your iPhones, I don't have a lot of confidence that they can get 18,000 members registered in a website 
let alone make them have to agree to a second set of terms and conditions before they can even exercise their right to vote that they paid the $40 membership to do. But that's a whole different subject right now. But uh, that's when the voting is. But I'm not 100% confident that they're even going to roll it out in time based on their minutes of their meetings and, and their board agenda and committee reports. And that's all I know is what I'm reading. And I'm not reading anything into that that I'm adding to, just taking history and fact. David Qualls, looking for your vote and humbly hoping that you will listen to what he said this evening and then make your own decisions. And then if you are uh, willing to give him your support, he'll gladly take it. Uh, It starts maybe January 2nd, but we'll see. So keep an eye on the KCBS website. That's kcbs.us. Uh, to make sure that the voting is going to happen on those dates. And Dave, always appreciate the time you give to the show, and good luck to you, my friend. Greg, thank you, and uh, good luck to everyone that's running. There's a good field of candidates out there. All right, there he is, David Qualls. Thanks, Dave. Look at this guy running for the board. That is uh, ballsy, as we say. All guests appear via the Traeger Grills hotline. A lot of people have Yummy. often said that is a thankless job, but and listen to those qualifications. Dave has the business acumen behind him to maybe push some of these great agendas forward that he's got. Hard to argue with those numbers, by the way. They are real numbers. All right, folks, let me talk to you quickly about Cook Shack before we get to Brian Crawford talking about pit spritz. Cook Shack manufactures smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of experience. Whether you barbecue in the backyard, in the competition circuit, or in a five-star dining facility, Cook Shack has the unit that will do the job. And with a full line of barbecue sauces, spices, pellets, and wood chunks, it's the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, Two blogs, Smoke and Grilling 101s, and a video cooking classroom. Check out their website at cookshack.com or follow them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, and Google+. Get advice and share your passion for barbecue on their world-class barbecue forum. Cookshack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion, Ed Fast Eddie Moore. The FEC 100, PG 1000, always customer favorites. The PG 1000 can actually double as a smoker and a grill. Low and slow, hot and fast, pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. Cook Shack Residential Electric Smokers, number one in the industry. High quality means high durability and versatility. Anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cook Shack. Passion and dedication drives Cook Shack's manufacturing with quality always being at the forefront. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800-423-0698 or visit their website at cookshack.com. Brian Crawford from Crawford's Barbecue coming up next. Stick around. Be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. The segment brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via Bluetooth. And if you have Alexa or the Google Assistant in your home, you're in luck because Fireboard is fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. That's 816-945-2232. And we thank the good folks at Fireboard for their continued support of the show. All right, helping me close it out tonight, a competitive barbecuer, Texas-based, and he's brought a product to market that he hopes you will try. We're always trying for ways to make barbecuing both easier, more efficient, and more flavorful, and he hopes to have something that will take care of both or all of these at the same time. So we'll race to the Traeger Grills hotline and welcome a first-timer to the show, Brian Crawford. Brian, how are you, buddy? Good. How about yourself? Absolutely fabulous, Brian. Appreciate you making time for the show this evening. Uh, great to have you here. So before we get into the pit spritz and some of the other stuff, a uh, quick background on you, how you got into barbecue, uh, what you might do professionally, and uh, then we'll dive more into the barbecue stuff. Uh, I got into barbecue uh, just like everybody else, I reckon, that uh, just in the backyard trying to – is that better? Yeah, you sound fine. Okay. 
uh, in the backyard. We're passionate and making food for family and friends and and uh, all that good stuff. But uh, and then after a while, I learned that there's a competition circuit out there. So I uh, eventually felt like I was good enough to win, and I was sorely wrong. <laughs> it took a lot, a lot. Uh, uh, contest to figure out just how bad I was and how much I needed to learn. Uh, it was quite a learning curve. Uh, and finally, you know, the last couple of years, I've been starting to compile some wins and at least be competitive. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's it's an addictive, addictive sport for sure. Uh, if I could do it every weekend, I would. Are you uh, mostly IBCA or Texas sanctioned, or do you get out and, and do some of the other stuff like FBA and KCBS? Right now, just IBCA. As I'm right here in San Antonio. There's, I believe, four KCBS contests in Texas and uh, two in the Houston area, one in the Dallas area, and one in, in Austin area. I haven't uh, dipped my toe in that uh, just yet. I figure I'll it, – it's so easy just to do – the IBCA right here in San Antonio area because I could be at there's generally a contest almost every weekend within an hour from my house so uh, I'm not like some of these guys who live out in the boondocks and have to drive four or five hours just to one one contest and then turn around and drive four or five hours back home so I'm lucky to be centrally located to a lot of contests do you have a competitive streak in you where you just like to try it because now it's four meets instead of three, and you're doing a pork shoulder that you don't do on an IBCA, or uh, just because it's close, you'd like to give it a try? No, I, I, I want to dip my foot into some KCBS and uh, you know challenge those guys. I know that uh, as an IBCA cook, that uh, as as IBCA cooks as a whole, they're they're good enough to win. All you got to do is look at all the great IBCA cooks that are out there beating KCBS guys all the time. You know, uh, Ernest Cervantes, Fred Robles, Fred Robles right, right. Uh, guys like that. I mean, every time they go up against KCBS guys, they're they're holding their own not to just whip their butts. So, so it's not uh, that IBCA guys can't beat KCBS. It's just uh, uh, we're we're well for me. It's just a lot more convenient to do IBCA. Brian Crawford joining me here on the show, Pitmaster Crawford's Barbecue Team and the creator of Pit Spritz. Crawford'sBBQ.com is the website if you want to check it out. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the product called Pit Spritz. Uh, how do you use it, and what's the win for the consumer? Well, the primary use is obviously the spritz. Uh, you take the the... The peach, for instance, is that's that's the one that's available right now. I have several more flavors going to be available here in the next month. Uh, as as you're sitting there cooking your ribs, you know, every 15, 20 minutes, I like to spritz them. You know, keep the moisture up on them, keep uh, that outer layer from getting too dry. I mean, I personally don't want a, a stringy bark at the end of the cook with the uh, with the ribs, and so it helps keep the the rib itself moist. And then also with the spritz, like the peach, for instance, it's going to add a, a sweet pitch, peach flavor. And I have a lot of sugar in it, so that sugar is going to help caramelize on there and uh, just give it a good zing at the end. Uh, and it does have a little bit of butter, and anything that has butter in it when you're cooking is going to make it better. So, so while you're – before you got into the pit spritz business, uh, you were obviously doing – some of all of this during your cooking process, whether you were just spritzing it with like apple juice or peach juice or whatever you're using, and then maybe during a, a I don't know if you wrap your ribs, but you're maybe throwing butter in there. Was it just like, hey, why don't I figure out a way to fit all of this into a bottle? It's easy to go. I can stick a spray head on it, and you know now I've eliminated steps and really made it a more efficient process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I trimmed down about three different steps into one step with this, uh, with my spritz. And now, for instance, when I wrap, I just have three ingredients. I have my spritz as the liquid, and I'll throw a little brown sugar, and, and sometimes I'll throw a little honey on the top. But when I wrap, you know, I'm pouring three, four ounces of spritz at the bottom, and that provides a nice, juicy steam uh, to help, again, enhance more moisture at the end of the cook. 
I always love the journey of getting to a product that you feel is comfortable taking to market. So how many different revisions or recipes did you have to go through from your initial uh, genesis of we're going to put this in a bottle to when you said, hey, this is good enough to take to market? Uh, it, it was a lot more difficult than what I thought it was going to be. I I thought it was going to be a lot easier, but uh, as everything in life, it's never as easy as you might think it's going to be. <laughs> so my first, the, when I first started doing it, it you know, I, I had to go through several packaging companies that would even talk to me at a low scale because a lot of these packaging companies wanted me to give them a $50,000 order. I'm like... Ooh, that's a little bit uh, that's a little bit tight right now. You I don't, don't have that I'm in that, your pocket. That, no, I'm not that committed <laughs> yet. And uh, so then, once you get a packaging company that is willing to go, you know, on a small scale with you that you can afford, then at that point, you're going to go back and forth with your recipe. Uh, and the thing I learned also about recipe is, you know, it's one thing to make a recipe in your kitchen where you. Uh, you got all the access to several different things. But another thing to make that recipe in an industrial kitchen to where they are going to need uh, the buy the products at bulk, and you need to make it your recipe be able to transfer over to something they can do in bulk and bottle for you. You know, so, such as uh, if you were using an ingredient in your recipe that is, say, not widely available then you, it's going to be tough to do your recipe. So you have mm. to have your recipe easy to duplicate in the commercial setting. Is I guess it, that would be, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, is there a lot of back and forth between you and the co-packer that say, hey, Brian, you're calling for X. We feel that from a, as you said, maybe a sourcing perspective. And then, of course, it all comes down to overall cost. If you just switch and go from, of this to this, uh, it's going to be easier for us to get. It's going to be cheaper per bottle or, or per unit. It's going to save you this kind of money. You'll be able to build a little bit more margin in on the sales side. Do you have a lot of conversation in that? And do you feel like you had to compromise somewhere or did you refuse to compromise to make sure that it was a Brian Crawford product that you were putting out there? Well, I did have to, to switch things up a little bit just to so I, he, he, I was introduced to some ingredients that you know, I never really thought of. He'd be like, uh, try this ingredient because I can buy it in bulk. And so I would go buy this ingredient and I try to repeat it in my kitchen to get what I wanted. So I had a lot of going back and forth to try to make what I originally made that I really loved and then transfer the ingredients to what he said he can get to duplicate in the long run, that, to, that, and that stuff goes back and forth. It's not like uh, he has time to sit there with me hours on end. So it's like weeks before you get that figured out. And then finally, when you get something that you like, then you send them the, the recipe, and then they send you a test batch. And then if, they like the te- if, you, if I like the test batch, then we're good. And then, then we got another hurdle we got to go through. Then we got to have it tested, you know, have it FDA approved. Uh, we had to have uh, nutritional facts done, and then that's that's a pain. <laughs> Plus if labeling it thing, and it's bottling, and your bottle has a spray head. So, I mean, you have a couple other components that your traditional rub or sauce doesn't really have to contend with either. Yeah. But one thing I, I liked about the, the spritz when I first came out with it, and even still to this day, is, you know, the rubs and sauces, there's a million of them. Yep. I mean, how many spritzes are there? Well, no, that's what I, I was going to say. There's I mean, none. you're you're pretty unique to the market. So, um, from a price point perspective, where is a, a bottle of pit spritz right now? Uh, right now, it's a bottle of pit spritz, uh, if you buy it on my website, it's eleven dollars. And I'm in several stores uh, in the, you know, Texas area. And I'm hoping to get in several stores all over. I mean, obviously, I'd like to to grow this uh, as large as possible and uh, at least make enough money to pay for my expensive barbecue habit. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you hit the nail right on the head. Expensive barbecue habit. Um, I mean, is it is is uh, is eleven bucks a bottle like competitive? I mean, like you said, you're kind of unique in the market, so you don't have a lot of other things that you can say. Well, 
you know, the ingredients are a pretty big difference. So here's why one might be X price and one may, one might be Y price. Do you or do you just set a price and see where it goes and you have some well, flexibility to adjust? If, if you look at uh, other, you know, when I looked at other competition items, you know, like uh, there's rib glazes and and all these different things that, you know, we use all the time. You take a bottle of rib glaze, it's 11 bucks average. And it's actually got less less in it. I mean, my bottle's a 16 ounce bottle, and uh, you can get well, depending on how how much you use during your cooking process. If you use it in a foil wrap, obviously you use more. But if you're going to use it strictly spritz, you're going to get you know three four cooks out of it. So, you know, it, it it will go a long ways. You know, and you have to remember, I'm on a very small scale. You know, if I'd have ordered that fifty thousand dollars, then yeah, they would have done it a lot uh, per bottle, a lot cheaper. So you know, if uh, that's the thing with any specialty item, I think a, a person sees in a store buying from somebody small like myself, it's going to be a little more because we can't afford to to do a semi load at a time. You know, peaches out now. You had mentioned there's going to be other flavors coming in a month or so. What other flavors are you currently working on? I have apple and pineapple going to be out. Nice. And uh, one that I think that is going to be real exciting for a lot of people I've been getting, because I've made some just like what's going to be made from them and given them out to a few people is beef, which is going to work real good on uh, brisket for the competition guys. And uh, and like I said, all these work great in the wraps. And I've even had a few people uh, using it in um, injections. And I had a, a, a chef friend of mine made a marinade out of my peach. Uh, there's, you know, it's got a lot of different uses. The sky's the limit. Heck, if you want to take a little vodka and seven up and throw throw an ounce or two of peach in there, you got your cocktail. <laughs> That's right. A little butter. I mean, no problem. We love that. Makes it go down That's a right. little bit easier. Uh, Crawfordsbbq.com is the website if you want to check it out. Are there any other non-spritz products that you're looking to unveil over the course of 2019 or is spritz yeah where it's i do at? have a barbecue sauce that i like uh, real well uh just i've been running it it's two you know what as a competition guys you know hardly anybody runs just a single sauce on their for their glaze mm-hmm. you, you know they're mixing and matching two three different things and this is two-thirds of my mix and match of my glaze so it's a i i, I really like the sauce and I, my website has some different swag type stuff to kind of fill it up a little bit you know shirts and hats and uh just more junk you could fill your house up with why not Go if ahead. you're looking That's to right. <laughs> step up that uh rib game with a little peach flavor and uh, added some efficiency to the process brian's asking you to consider heading over to the website crawfordsbbq.com and picking up one or seven cases of the pit spritz. Again, that's peach flavor for now, but you got apple and you got pineapple coming down the pike as well sooner than later. Uh, Brian, always appreciate the time, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Real quick, can yeah. I say one thing? Please. Uh, if you're listening out there or wherever and you have a local barbecue store that you go to, yes. ask for it. Tell them to get contact me. I'd love to uh, get it in the store, yeah, the, if- your local store. Then you don't have to pay shipping, and uh, everybody's a little happier. And you got it on hand in case you happen to just run out at the worst time, which it always is the worst time. And exactly. If, if you have any questions or you can't get a hold of Brian, get a hold of me. I can uh, make sure you get all his contact information as well so we can get those mom-and-pop shops set up with some pit spritz from Crawford's Barbecue as well. Uh, Brian? Or you might tell him about the promo code you got. Uh, why don't you tell him? <laughs> well, right now, and any of the central lights out there want that get ten percent off, just use the promo code Greg. G R E G, very easy, and you get ten percent off. So, Brian, appreciate you doing that as well, and uh, appreciate you uh, supporting the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in ten minutes or less. By the way, absolutely That's great, great partnership there. Uh, so, uh, are you going to be cooking before the end of the year's up, Brian? No, I, I just finished cook off last weekend in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, it was a pretty good size one. Uh, Briscoe County Ranch, there's 151 teams. Ooh. I had pretty good luck. I had 11th place brisket and a 13th, nice. or excuse me, 14th chicken. Uh, so I, I was pretty happy considering it was uh, the who's the who's in Texas barbecue pit masters. Uh, uh, your friend Fred Robles, he got yep. first place brisket. You know, he's a. Uh, He's always one that uh, 
gets not lots of nice walks and uh, uh, can't can't go wrong with uh, with Fred's cooking class that he's got coming up too. No doubt, the Texas contests always seem to pull into the into the hundreds of teams, which is also yeah. uh, pretty cool to see. So, uh, once again, the website is crawfordsbbq.com. We're talking with the pitmaster of Crawford's barbecue team, Brian Crawford. And Brian, appreciate your time tonight. Absolutely. There he is. Get the pit spritz for crying out loud. What are you waiting for? Of course you want to try it. Everybody loves new products that are coming out, right? All guests appear via the Traeger Grills hotline. Love new products. Mm, mm, mm. All right, here we go. Let's talk to you quickly about Big Papa Smokers, and then we will look to wrap the show. Crawfordsbbq.com, the website, once more. Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue-related. Their curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at BigPapaSmokers.com has been Pitmaster approved by Sterling Big Papa Ball himself. They have championship rubs and seasonings, popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit. I like the Double Secret Steak Rub and Little Louie's Season Salt. Why not? Big Papa's offers 13 perfectly balanced flavors that transform ordinary meals into extraordinary. Looking to improve the flavor of your competition barbecue recipes? Why not add a little Simply Marvelous Barbecue? That's right, they've combined forces with them over there, and that's called the West Coast Offense. You know, over the past few years, the West Coast Offense has cornered the market on competitive barbecue and redefined flavor profiles that cooks from across the country have begun to aim for. They also have the online exclusive for those Simply Marvelous rubs, so stop by the website and pick some up today. Aside from the premium selection of rubs, they also have some great sauces. They also offer the very best pellet charcoal and wood cookers available today. If you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, check out the Mac 2 Star General Pellet Grill. Big Papa Smokers is the exclusive Mac dealer, and they even offer special packages. If you're not a fan of the pellet smokers, that's fine. Take a look at the Old Hickory Ace BP. It's the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. If you're a backyard barbecue enthusiast like me or some of the other Central Lights, for a durable and versatile grill that's easy to use and will last forever, might I suggest the M Grill from Texas. It's just what you need. They're built like tanks. If you're not sure of what grill you need, you can't go wrong with anything featured on BigPapaSmokers.com. They have something for every kind of backyard cooking budget, and it's clear that this is the place to go, right, for all things barbecue and grilling related. If you have any questions, give them a call, 877-828-0727, or shop the website, BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers.com. Let's wrap it up. Stick around. We'll be right back. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you've found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. And we thank Brian Crawford once again for joining us last segment, talking about the pit spritz. Always love finding out the stories and the genesis of products i love when people take the risk because if i'm being honest i'm not taking any of that risk no way however he's right he's a little unique to the market it's not just another rub or not just another sauce so that's really cool so we wish brian good luck and if you're interested in giving it a shot certainly go ahead on over to crawfordsbbq.com and pick up a bottle of the peach pit spritz 10 percent off if you use coupon code Greg, G-R-E-G. All the way back in the first hour, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. We talked tenderloins, Chateaubriand, and safety for food vacuums and prime rib. Great stuff. We talked about how our football teams are also back in contention, kind of. Finally. After Meathead, we talked with David Qualls. He's running for the KCBS Board of Directors coming up. Voting might start January 2nd. DavidQualls.com is website if you want to check out his platforms. That's Q-U-A-L-L-S. And then we wrapped it up with Brian Crawford from Crawford's Barbecue. Big show planned for you next week as always. Coming up on the end of the year, coming up on the huge two-hour embedded correspondence segment on Christmas Day. 
There will be a show on Christmas. September 11th, 2001. I will never forget until next time. This is your program host and proud U.S. American Greg Reppy saying good night now.